Well, it's a blessing. I love to hear the truth, even when the truth is uh, uh, a little sour to take, but it's the truth. I appreciate that, what Brother James just pointed out is the truth. Um, I think of that verse, we don't talk much about it, but uh, Philippians 1 says this, in uh, verse 29, for unto you is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And uh, one of the things we've been hearing gospel preaching uh, the last two days and uh, today, and one of the things that has uh, happened, Brother Tim Fuller made reference to it. And something you ought to think about is the word gospel, Kind of, it's uh, really a watered down word. A lot of people think they're hearing the gospel or on the radio or in their church when they're really not. And uh, I, know, <clears throat> I know where I'm at, but let me just encourage everybody. I, I'm an independent Baptist, and, and I know where I stand on the Bible and all those things. But I like to read men, and my pastor, Brother Ron Ralph, <clears throat> always encouraged us not to be afraid to read men that we disagreed with. That's why I buy Brother Knox's books all the time. <laughs> I'm kidding. <clears throat> But I'll, he said, you don't want to, he goes, if all you ever do is read men who agree with what you already know, you're not going, you're not going to think. And a lot of people aren't thinking these days. So when I say this, I'm not saying that, oh man, this guy's great. I want to model everything about this, uh, my ministry after this man. But there is a man, he's not an independent Baptist. He's not a King James Bible believer, but he is justified. And uh, he loves Jesus Christ. And I figured I'd feel that coolness right there. It's okay. Uh, and he preaches on the street, and he has, uh, God has used the man to help me. His name is Ray Comfort. And he has a booklet uh, that is called, God Has a Wonderful Plan for Your Life. Now, he's written, or his writers, or whoever, I don't know if he actually writes all these books, but he's written a lot of different books, and his, his, he's got one theme, but it's a theme that's needful, and that is you cannot really preach the gospel of the grace of God until you preach the law of God. And that is true. Uh, and when I bring up the law in, my, in his, his teaching, the principle of his teaching is dead on. And uh, I did not say, you know, I, I, I guess I don't have to say that around here. Most of you are very loving, independent, King James Bible believing Baptist here. And because uh, you got Pastor Timmy as your leader, amen. <laughs> but what I'm saying is this, he points out that there's a lot of bogus gospels going around that give people the impression that if you come to Jesus Christ, he'll fix your bank account. He will fix, you know, he did not, Jesus did not die because you feel lonely. Jesus Christ did not suffer and die on the cross because you have an esteem problem. And by the way, uh, let me just throw this in here. And I'll eventually get to my text. If not, then you brethren can get, get it all tonight. Amen. But, you know, people talk about self-righteousness and pride gets trouble started in churches, and that's true. But can I tell you something? Insecurity gets a lot of problems started, too, if not more. Because somebody comes up and says, well, I don't know what they're sitting in my seat for. Well, you know, they don't think much of me. Well, I know I'm nothing but. And so a lot of times people's insecurity is what causes them to be so sensitive to everything that's said. Okay, and, uh, and so people get to thinking that Jesus, well, he's here to fulfill my self-esteem issues or my insecurity issues. That's not why he died. There's some song that they, uh, you know, I know he carried our sorrows and I know he carried our griefs and all of that. But some of the benefits of his suffering we'll not experience until the millennial kingdom when we are glorified. But right now, what the, the, the gospel, as it is unfolded in the book of Romans, it is all about our condemnation in Adam. And it is all about the riches of the glories of His grace in Christ that can be had by simply believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when He takes care of these issues, those are the greatest issues we have. When it comes time to die, like the gentleman I spoke of last night that I heard about who was dying saying, what if I'm going to hell anyway? He, he had, uh, you know, over half a million dollars in the bank. He had uh, term life insurance, had it all worked out financially. He wasn't suffering. Enough. But you know something? That stuff didn't matter anymore. Yeah. Yeah. What mattered is, was his standing with God. Yeah. Yeah. And the gospel is good news that you can have peace with God in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Yeah. And in the midst of a life that doesn't always go the way you want it to go. Yeah. You still got a, a living Savior, an advocate that ever liveth to make intercession for us. Yeah. Praise the Lord.
Now here are my here are my verses this evening, this afternoon, whatever time it is. I know this. It's my time to preach. So let's look at it. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, the Bible says this. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die but God. There's a contrast between verse 7 and verse 8. I thank God that he often writes things to illustrate to us and to get through our minds and, and reach our hearts and our understanding by a thing called contrasts. And he is showing us something that we can relate to about how someone might die. That's not something that happens very often, that one man would put his life in danger or be willing to die for someone else. That does happen from time to time. And he reminds us it's a scarce thing. It scarcely happens, but for scarcely for a righteous man, one will die. And yet peradventure, that means possibly, for a good man, some would even dare to die, but God. So he's showing you that man's love is on this level, but God is going to go a higher level. And he says, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Not when we were good people. Not when we were seeking God. We heard it yesterday from Brother Andrew Ray. Nobody's seeking God. They weren't seeking him back then before the cross. And they're certainly not seeking him now. In fact, many times the reason people preach bogus gospels, plastic fake gospels, humanistic, human-scented gospels is because it offers some particular benefit to humanity right now, some temporal benefit. But the, the truth is God deals in eternal things. And while we were yet sinners, before we were seeking Him, before we were hunting for Him, Christ died for us. Listen, I'm not a tulip man. And you say, what's that? You even hear people talk about Calvinism. I don't, you know, I'm not into the five points of tulip, but I'm not, uh, I'm not an Armenian flower either, which is the daisy. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. So I don't go for either flower. The truth is always between those two flowers. But the truth of the matter is God is the instigator of salvation. He came hunting for us. We didn't go hunting for him. And uh, we're going to talk about that. Let's pray. Father, help me, I pray, to get these truths across. What a great passage of Scripture. What great truth we've already enjoyed from Romans 4 and the beginning of Romans chapter 5. I pray, Lord, you'd help me to add to this conference now and be useful to this church. And, Lord, I pray you'd help me to magnify your son, Jesus Christ. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Now, I was so thrilled when I got my assignment because these are great passages, but just as Brother uh, Andrew Ray has pointed out, we get so comfortable and so familiar with these truths that uh, it's almost intimidating for a pastor to some degree to get up and preach on these things that you've heard a thousand times. But that is our problem. Because, you know, the old saying is familiarity breeds contempt. Now, I'm not saying we're, uh, con we look at the gospel in a contemptive way, but, you know, I have heard people make this suggestion. You get up and preach in our style churches where there is a lot of Bible expounded, and I'm glad for that, where there are a lot of uh, things and details that we dig into that maybe you don't get in the average church, and that's wonderful. The Bible is to be expounded. That is good. But let us never get over uh, the, the breathless wonder of the gospel that makes all of this uh, uh, that makes it worthwhile, that makes it, that's the reason why we're getting together is because of the man, Christ Jesus, and what he has done. I have heard people leave church as they walk by and they'll say, well, you know, that's a good, you know, gospel message. I've even had people kind of tease and say, but you know, most of us are saved. We've heard that before. Can I tell you something that Paul, when he was preaching to the church at Corinth, which was not a good example of a New Testament church, correct? They had all kinds of problems, kind of like our churches. Amen. There was moral issues. There was some fornication going on. Uh, there, there was some sort of possible incestuous thing happening. There were lawsuits being slapped on one another. I mean, there was envy, strife, and division because... Uh, the pastor didn't mention that I brought the coffee filters to the last fellowship meal. I'm sick of being in this church and not being appreciated. Paul dealt with all that carnality. 
And he dealt with all of that sin and all of that mess that goes on in churches uh, because it's full of people who've been washed and justified in the name of Christ but are still battling, hey men, the old nature that's still very much alive and well in one sense. I'm, you know, work with me here. Don't, don't correct me. I understand we died with Christ. I get all that. But that's next Bible conference. We're not in chapter 6 yet. But here's what Paul did after. And then, then there was carnal folks in there that thought, I'm really going to show off what a spiritual person I am while uh, I'm drunk at the Lord's table. I can talk in tongues. So all that stuff is in there. By the way, Paul never instructed anybody in that church to leave it. I've had people get in my face and say, if that's what's going to go on around here, I'm going somewhere else. I'm like, really? Go ahead. But guess what? You're going to find more of the same down the road. Really? And so after 14 chapters of Paul chewing them out and straightening them out, what does he bring up in chapter 15 to a bunch of people according to chapter 6? who were one time, all of those things, but now in Christ Jesus you're washed, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Those are saved people. And he says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. He takes them back to Calvary to remind them, here's what it's all about. And here's something that you should never get over, the breathless wonder of being forgiven, justified, having the clothing of righteousness. Now, as Brother... Uh, Ray was preaching about, you know, the different uh, things that's going on there in Romans 4 about what Christ took away or what God took away and what God gave us in place of that. It reminds me of, a, uh, of a, 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 just a simple illustration, but you think how salvation is, is, God does things in threes many times, and the first thing a man has to have when he gets saved is he's got to be stripped of all of his filthy rags of self-righteousness. But then he is washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. What's underneath that man that's underneath all that fake religion? But then the washing is followed up with a clothing. And that's what he was talking about. Our self-righteousness, we got to repent of that, throw that aside. But then Christ washes us, forgives us of our sins, but he doesn't just leave us standing there, amen, washed without a covering, if you will. He robes us in his righteousness. And right here we've got some things and these verses that are just tremendous, and I know you've heard them a thousand times, and he's kind of restating what we've seen back in chapter 3, but it's all tied in together on this thing about justification and about our salvation, of which we still should be rejoicing because we have received the atonement. Notice you don't make it. He made it. We just get to receive it if you want it. And so in verse 6 he says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, I want to point out two things tonight before we go eat. Number one, there was a proper timing for all of this. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't have all the full understanding. I know I don't know all that's going on in that verse right there. I don't know why God chose to send His Son 2,000 years ago after approximately 4,000 years of, of fallen humanity living on this earth, but I can uh, give you what my thoughts are as far as why one of those reasons might be. I mean, why didn't, why didn't as soon as Adam fell and as soon as they were to be expelled from the garden, God didn't send his son right then? The truth of the matter is I don't have those answers and I'm not supposed to. I just know this, God is never late, but he's rarely early. <laughs> he is always right on time. Remember what Martha said to him? She said, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. He said, you don't understand. I, it wasn't that Jesus Christ was going, I don't know what I'm going to do for the next couple of days. He stayed where he was. He did not go to that funeral until it was the right time. He comes at the right time. And we may never understand that. All I can tell you is the Lord always does that which is right. His choices, his timing is always perfect. Just believe that and you'll get down the road a lot farther. The Bible says when the fullness of time was come, God sent His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, Old Testament saints, that we might receive the adoption of sons, New Testament saints. And so you've got this thing going on where He says in due time. Why do you think, Brother all top that God waited to when he did. Well, I don't know for sure. I'm not God. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. But I can tell you this, that one of the things might have been 
to prove to us that we really were without strength. Because it's one thing to say you're ungodly, but it's another thing to say you have no strength to change anything about yourself. Ungodliness means you're not like God. Without strength means you're weak. And you have no ability. So what does God do? He gives 4,000 years of humanity to watch it, to observe it, to see that there really are none righteous. There really were none that were able to pull themselves up and strain and stretch and work and reach out and lay hold of eternal life by themselves. It's impossible. So what did God do? A lot of times, what do we do? When we have a, a child that won't listen, we say, now wait a minute, let me help you with that. Oh, why, Dad? I can do this. No, you can't. You can't do that. And you know what you sometimes do just to prove your point? Let them struggle at it for a while. Go ahead go ahead and do what you're going to do there, and I'll wait until you'll figure it out. I will prove to you by your lack of strength or your lack of ability that you cannot do what I told you you could not do. You'll, you'll believe me if I give you a chance to prove it to yourself. So what do you do? You go back through the Bible. It gave uh, God some time to show that all humanity was without strength. Brother James made a, a great point. He made a statement that I totally, I get it when he said it. I know what he meant. It was some sarcasm. I know he doesn't normally use that. But yesterday he said this. He said, how were they saved in the Old Testament? He said, was anybody saved in the Old Testament? Now, what, what did he mean by that? He meant when you read through it, you're going, wow, the heroes of the faith are a big mess. I mean, we've got Noah who found grace. There's a New Testament word. Yes, he found grace. What did he find grace? God gave him a message and said, here's what you do. Build a boat. Build an ark. And uh, the, I'm going to mess some of you up right here, but it messed me up, so I'd like to mess somebody else up with it. I'm going to mess up some, some good preaching. <laughs> and he was not up there. He preached righteousness, but there's no indication he was saying, get on the ark with us. Hebrews 11, 7 says that that ark he prepared was for his household. The grace that God gave him was the fact that he, could, he still had a conscience that could receive a signal from God. He could hear, judgment's coming, you got to get ready. Listen, if somebody else wanted to get saved, amen, before the flood came, they would have had to build an ark. He made that for his family. Why? Because he could still hear from God and God was gracious and gave him warning of what to do. And by the way, it says that he received the righteousness and he was an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So he believed what God told him and his works proved that he believed it. All right? What does he do after the judgment comes and the, and the judgment has fallen? It's just him, his three sons, his, his wife, his three uh, daughter-in-laws, the next thing you know, hey, he moved, we, know he, we know he moved with fear. We know he believed God. We know he built an ark. He became an heir of the righteousness by faith. But we also know that he, he found some liquor after the boat landed. And he got drunk. And he was passed out. And, and you can fill in the blanks of whatever you believe went on in Genesis chapter 9. God always writes the Bible so as not to dirty our minds up. But he lets you know something is, something's way off here. Something's bad going on. I mean, he's handing out blessings and cursings. And you say, what's the point? The point is God says, well, he got drunk. That's Noah who had found grace, who feared God and moved and believed what God had said. Then we find Abraham after his belief of God's promise in Genesis 15, after he's been accounted righteous in the sight of God. We find him with his dear wife, who was obviously a looker. And he tells Sarah on the way down, he says, hey, look, uh, we're fixing to go down here to Gerar, and uh, I'm nervous because they're going to see you, and they're going to want to take you and do awful things to you, and they're going to kill me. So I want you to lie so they don't kill me. They'll still do terrible things to you, but <laughs> no man ever yet hated his own flesh. And by the way, you say, well, where's, what's this stuff about submission? In 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says that that holy woman trusted God. When your head, Abraham was her head, she called him Lord. That setup is still good today in this dispensation. And somebody said, my husband ain't worth, uh, amen, his leadership ain't worth submitting to. The Bible didn't say if his leadership was worth it that you were to submit. God said, you love me, do what I say, submit to your head. 
Sarah was a holy woman. Abraham's leadership was terrible. So what did she do? She trusted in the umbrella that was above Abraham. She trusted in God, said God. My husband is not telling them all the truth. I'm his half-sister, but a half-truth is a whole lie. So God says, no, don't worry, sis. I'll take care of this. Hey, Abimelech, you touch that woman, and I'm going to kill you. Lord, in the innocency of my hands, the integrity of my heart, have I done this? Wait a minute, how, how did Abimelech know that adultery was wrong? Because it was in his conscience, way before the law, man. And he says, I'll give that man back his wife. He said, that'd be a good thing. So Abraham gets rebuked by a heathen king. Why? And he called what he was about to bring upon him. He said, why did you bring this great sin? Adultery. Because you're a liar, Abraham. That's a righteous man in the sight of God. You move on to Moses. Here is Moses, the, me- the Bible says, and you got to believe the record of the Bible, he was the meekest man on the earth. I believe that. And he's, he's pastoring the church, if you will. There's a picture there, a congregation, the children of Israel in the wilderness, and he is fed up. And they said, hey, give us water. We're gonna, you brought us out here to, man, remember the onions and the watermelons and all of the wonderful stuff before the lockdown? Amen, back in Egypt. And Moses says, hey, he goes, must we fetch you rebel, water out of this rock, ye rebels? God had told Moses, just talk to that rock. It's a picture. He takes the rod, whack. Well, he gets the water, but God says, in your haste, in your irritation, in your anger, you disobeyed me, guess what? Uh, you're not going into the promised land. I had a man uh, one time had to deal with a situation I don't want to get the details, but it was an ugly situation. It had to do with a child. Is that enough information? And sometimes you have to deal with problems, and it's painful to deal with the problems. And the man who caused the problem was put away out of the church. Amen. And the man on his deathbed a decade later had a good pastor tell me, before this thing ends... He will not be the perpetrator of a crime. He will be the victim of you and church discipline. When I visited that man on his deathbed, he said, I don't understand why you did to me what you did. I want to say, I don't understand how you did what you did. But he said, when God forgives, God forgets. And I said, well, tell that to Moses. Now, Don't split hairs with me. I'm just saying this. That Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. But it does not say there is therefore now no consequences to them which are in Christ Jesus. Your sin in this life will have some fruit. It will have some effect. Moses was, is Moses in heaven? Yes. Absolutely. But guess what? Down here he missed out on some earthly blessings because of his sin. So what's Moses? He got an anger problem. He needs to have some anger management classes. Moses, hero of the faith. We're not talking about Nebuchadnezzar's pride, amen, the the pagan king. We're not talking about Lot who we say, well, you know, Lot, he was righteous though, according to 2 Peter chapter 2. He was just righteous and godly. Last time I read about him back there in Genesis 19, he's, uh, amen, involved in incest. He's drunk and gets uh, trapped into some incest there. How, listen, it's just a mess. We're not even talking about, we're talking about the good guys of the Old Testament. We look at David, amen, a man that God says, I like him. You say, well, he, God loves everybody. Yeah, but he doesn't like everybody. Because what did he say? He goes, God liked me to make me king. I mean, David is a great example. We love reading about, amen, him out there. You picture him. Nobody was thinking about him when when, uh, Samuel came to anoint the next king of Israel, the right king, you know, and all the sons of Jesse are there. He goes, where's none of these boys? Get these boys out of here, you know, because God looketh on the heart, not on the appearance. That's the context of that. And he says, you have another son somewhere? Uh, Yeah, I got a little boy out there, youngest boy's out in the, the field, tending sheep. What's he out there doing? He's practicing his harp. He's working with a sling and all those, and just taking care of some sheep. Nobody forgot about him. 
And man, we love David, especially I love to do a devotion with my boys about uh, 1 Samuel 17, amen. And here comes uh, David down there and the whole army's all afraid, you know, and, and uh, there's the big bad Goliath out there, the uncircumcised Philistine. Come on, send somebody to me. And man, out comes young David, maybe 16, 17 years old, just right in his forehead, you know, down. You've heard it all. He hits his knees, falls forward, but that's not enough. Man, David runs there, grabs that giant sword, leaps up on the body, whew, decapitates the giant, grabs him by his hair, swinging that head around, going into Jerusalem with blood flying. Hey, if you've never given that as a devotion about a thousand times to some young boys, hey, man, you've missed out. And I always tell them, when you go into David's, you know, study there in the palace, you look and there's a moose and there's a bear and there's a, an ox in there. What's that, Dad, with all the hair? Well, I took that to the taxidermist. That's Goliath. Boy, he got his eyes just set, you know, all crooked in his head. Well, that's what he looked like right before he hit the ground. David. He behaved himself wisely. Then you come to 2 Samuel 11. And then you say, hmm. I wish I could just kind of jump over this. My hero's fixing to go to zero. And not only does he commit adultery, but then to try to cover up that sin, you know the story, has a man murdered. And he never pulled the trigger and he never shot the arrow. He just cast a vote that says, I'll vote for somebody that'd kill babies. Oh, I'm sorry, that's something different. Same principle. Same principle. He wrote it out, sealed it up in a note, said, here, nobody will see this. You just take that, Joab, and you put him in the hottest part of the battle. We can get rid of this. God charged him with murder. David, a man after God's own heart who served his generation by the will of God. A man God liked, a man God loved. But his lust slew him in a moment of weakness and then we could go to Solomon, a picture of Jesus Christ reigning in the millennium. I mean, the wisest man who warns all of us young men and old men about the harlot woman, the strange woman that's always somewhere looking to destroy and to deceive. And he's all the time warning about those things, and yet this man falls by the very thing he warned us about. Nehemiah 13 verse 26 says that Solomon uh, was, was led into sin through outlandish women. And then you can come into the Gospels and you see Peter following the Lord and making great statements. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. To whom shall we go, Lord? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Some great things coming out of Peter's mouth. But boy, the night that Jesus Christ was arrested in his frustration, his irritation at what was going on and how hey, amen, he'd been told to put that sword up and all of these things, he is frustrated. And so he begins to deny that he even knows Jesus Christ. And along with those denials, he's cussing. I've had guys try to tell me, no, he just cursed, you know, cursed the, no, no, he was, he was a fisherman. He was using bad language to emphasize. He said, just so you know that I don't hang around with that guy, listen to how I'm talking. Because the way he was talking, they said, well, you couldn't be one with a Galilean because he doesn't, he doesn't talk like that. And Peter had to be a Baptist because after he got right after Pentecost, then he got up and he said, you denied the Holy One of Israel. It's like, that's just, a, that's like six weeks after somebody in the crowd could have been going, I mean, you're right, but man, I was in the courtyard with you. You were doing the same thing. Well, we'll talk about that later. You guys repent. And by the way, if you get right with God, you can preach on all the sins you were guilty of. You have to. Listen, what's the point? I'm saying men are without strength. Why did God wait to a certain time to send Christ to die for the ungodly? Just to prove to us that the best heroes of the Bible were all majorly flawed with sin and weakness and wickedness. History has shown that. Isn't it amazing that, that men have made great achievements? They've made great advancements in science and medicine, artists, advancements, education and all of this. But one place that man is always bankrupt is morality. 
I told you a couple years ago I had just come from uh, having an opportunity to speak at the religions class at Center College in Danville, Kentucky. And uh, I was nervous because those, those folks outclass me when it comes to intellect. They're going to be doctors and lawyers and all kinds of things. It's a liberal arts college. I mean, the religions professor's got earrings in his ear and from Egypt and all this. And he said, we want you to come and, and tell us what you believe. He said, we've had a Roman Catholic and, a, and a, a Muslim cleric and a Jewish rabbi. I thought he was fixing to tell me a joke when he was naming off who he'd had in the class. But he said, we want somebody else. And I know what they wanted. They wanted this. I said, I asked a guy at one point, like some kid asked, he goes, why do you guys get on the street like you do? I said, because. I said, he goes, does it work? I said, yes, it works. It unlocked this classroom for me. Yeah. So there's 30 other Baptist preachers in this county. I said, uh, Professor Pearson, I said, did you call me here because we preach on the street? And he went, I said, they wanted one of them crazy, fire-breathing fundamentalists to come into your class so we could argue over politics. But I'm not going to talk about politics. Amen. We're going to talk about the Word of God, the book you don't believe, but the one that you've never read. Amen. And one guy said, do you believe the philosophy that a man in a garden ate some fruit after a snake talked to his wife? I said, yes, I don't, that's not a philosophy, that's the truth. And I said, if you say oh, you don't believe that, my question is this. Explain to me why we're in the mess we're in. Give me the answer. Is it because we need more science, more education? We've got all of that. Is it because we need, we need uh, more laws? I mean, why are people concerned about racism? Because that's a problem. Why are people concerned about, and I'm not, but some people are worried about the polar bears running out of ice. I could care less. <laughs> Amen. Turn the heat up. Hallelujah. I'm cold. They drink too much Coke anyway. I want more of that for me. But some people are worried about that. They're worried about the atmosphere. And there probably is some weird stuff. The earth is groaning. Creation is groaning, waiting for something to happen. So I don't have any doubt that, amen, uh, when Hillary Clinton said, hey, the tide is up eight inches. I'm thinking, who cares? But nevertheless, that does indicate what the Bible's told us. The earth and creation is groaning, waiting for its Redeemer to come back. But why are people all the time concerned about this and about this and about uh, battered women and about what is all that, the root problem? Those are all symptoms. They're all symptoms of something that is fundamentally wrong with man and his God and his creator. And what is it? It's sin that has entered in and put us down, amen, and separated us from God. So Jesus Christ comes to where we are, amen, when we're without strength and without hope, amen. And he comes down and he does something for us that we could not do for God or not do for ourselves. And God says, I give you 4,000 years just to prove that you have no strength. So now it is time to manifest myself in a human body and die for the ungodly. And listen, when we think about that, that ought to overwhelm us. That God died for us not when we were trying to get to him, but when we were, had our backs to him, and while we were yet sinners, and I'll say simply this, that's the probable reason, the proper time that Christ came. But I can tell you this, in verse 8, God committed his love toward us in that. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know what this is? This is the proof that God loves sinners. Okay. Uh, you can talk a lot of things. You can say you love. Uh, many people give much love with their lips toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Their heart is far from Him. And too often that's been true of my own Christianity. But the truth of the matter is love will prove itself because love always gives. Love will prove itself. God has displayed his love for ungodly men by sending his son to die for us. We were on the street corner in Danville about a year ago. They have a big uh, brass band festival. That's a, a big deal where people come in. The brass bands are playing and all this. And we always get down there because there's a huge line of traffic and a huge uh, a lot of walkers and all that. Well, we're down there, and I'm, I'm on the street corner with a man who used to be the postmaster there in our town, and uh, he got to come to church years ago, about nine years ago, and he got plugged in. He is addicted to street preaching and public ministry. And what is such a blessing? Everybody pulls up and goes, Tom, is that you? 
yeah, hey, how's so-and-so doing and all this. I mean, he was selling stamps to people for years. And he, he knows everybody in that town, and they're going, what are you doing out here? He goes, let me tell you about the best thing that ever happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, he's one of the best gospel trackers I know. So him and I are standing there. He's got a uh, placard on. I've got one on that says, you must be born again. His says, Christ died for our sins. And here comes a couple, and the uh, man's wearing flip-flops and shorts, and so I know that he's not going to engage me in the conversation, but his bulldog wife will. <laughs> so she's leading him down the street, and so I told him, I said, get ready. I said, get ready. I said, we're, we're fixing to get a, a, the blessing of a good cussing. She comes by, and she gets to the thing, and she, you know, she's looking straight ahead, you know, and so... Uh, Tom says, how are you doing today? Waiting for the light to change, you know. The light changes. They never talk to the light changes. Let me tell you a quick story that just I thought of. i got to tell you this. It'll be a blessing to you. There's a brother who went to Germany. Uh, Robert Trump was his name. Some of you may know him. And he told him he was preaching all the time by himself on deputation at these street corners. And one night he was downtown somewhere, and he says, the, there was three or four lanes right there, and he says, the lane closest to me, he goes, these kids pulled up, he goes, all teenage boys, about 18 years old, said, they're in the car, and he said, they rolled the window down, and he said, I was preaching, I could see them out of my peripheral, and he goes, I knew what they were going to do, when the, light, when the arrow went green, they were going to come up out of there, he goes, but they didn't have the courage to engage me before the light turned, he said, well, the main lights turned green before he got the green arrow, and he goes, the one kid went, you know, so he said, I just kept preaching, and he says, when the arrow turned green, he come up out of there to say something, and he said, I stopped preaching and said, you're a sissy, you waited for the green arrow. <laughs> so don't you know his buddies teased him, yeah, man, you're a sissy, you waited up, you wouldn't even engage that preacher until you got the green arrow. <laughs> Wimp. So we're standing there, the light turns green, and she turns and she says, as she leads her husband across the street, she goes, don't you think that you ought to have a sign on? Don't you think you'd get more done if your sign said, God loves you? <laughs> now, I'd cry, I'd laugh if it wasn't so sad. His sign said, Christ died for our sins. That is God saying, hey, I love you, whether you think about me or not. And I'm coming down there where you're at, and I'm going to prove it. I'm not just going to talk about it. I'm coming down, and I'm going to manifest it right in front of everybody. It's going to go around the world. You say, what's going to, what's going to go around the world? I'm going to, in, if you will, I'm going to encapsulate myself in a human body, and I'm going to come down there and live sinless for 33 years, and I'm going to take upon myself uh, your sins and the sins of the world, and I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to pay the payment, the debt that you owe, and I'm going to meet the demands of the law. I'm going to do it all, and I'm going to be buried, and to prove that the payment was accepted, I'm going to get up from the dead because the Father says, yep, the account is clear, the account has been paid, Stand up, and God the Son gets up and comes out of the tomb, and God says, Here is, herein is my love. Not that you love me, but that I loved you so much that while you were a yet a sinner, I came down there and died. That shows you that most people have no clue what the cross means. They have no clue what the love of God really is. That woman's ignorance was displayed, but unfortunately, that's what religious people think all across America. To them, love means you never say anything that would offend somebody. To them, love means that you, you tell the sodomites that you guys are wonderful. And who am I? Love is love. That's what that phrase, love is love, is about, by the way. And, and you just tolerate all this wickedness, and we can all just be kind and get along and go to hell together. No. If you want to see some love, then you've got to go to a bloody cross. And you've got to survey that thing from every direction. And you've got to picture the blood, that divine blood of God that flowed from the veins of the Son of Man, dripping down that cross, dripping from His head, uh, from His hands, His feet, uh, off His shredded back, amen, down onto the ground. Why? Because He was dying and suffering and proving His love to us. It's not His life. It's not His miracles. 
It's not his teachings. Those are all valuable. But we heard what was the most valuable last night. What's precious is blood. And the precious blood is proof that he loved ungodly people. You realize Christ's teaching really condemns you. Because he said, you've heard it said of old, and he takes you to the Old Testament, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, that if a man look with lust upon a woman, he has committed adultery with her already in his heart. So the Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, his teachings raised the bar, if you will. Because he says, hey, you're just thinking about the action. I am thinking about the hard attitude. You know what I believe God showed me? People have always questioned, why does Jesus Christ bring up, and, and they say, well, this verse is misplaced in Luke 16, and it's over there right before in verse 19 where it starts uh, with the rich man and Lazarus. Right before that story, verse 18 of Luke 16, he says something about uh, the putting away and, and marriage and all of that. And they said, that's so out of place. But it's not. It never is. If you back up, you know who he was preaching to? A bunch of Pharisees. You know what he had told them? He talked about covetousness in that verse. You know what men do before they commit the act of adultery? They covet another man's wife in their heart. It's all put together just right. Now, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want to show you one place, and we're going to be done. Turn to Luke 7. This won't take long, I promise. I'll not keep you from the dinner table. Luke chapter 7. I used to wonder about this passage. I wondered, how, I know the gospel is in here, I can see it, but I can't quite get a hold of it to preach it. And like many times when we're in our Bible, there'll be one word that will unlock the mystery. At least this did for me. You know the story of the woman from the city, which gives you an indication of what she had been involved with. She comes into Simon the Pharisee's house here in Luke 7 when Jesus is set down to meet and uh, she's just weeping and pouring out that alabaster box of ointment. And uh, the old Pharisee, you know, he said, if this man were a prophet, in verse 39, speaking of Jesus Christ, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. Remember that forgiveness thing is financial terms, banking terms? He says, the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. That's not the big deal. Both of them are in debt. That's all that matters. Not the amount at this point. He says, when they had nothing to pay, he, the creditor, frankly forgave them both. Well, I know that's a picture of the grace of God because when God forgave us, he did not forgive us begrudgingly like, eh, I don't know, I, oh, I guess so. The son's not up there saying, Lord, look at these wounds. You've got to forgive them. We've already heard about that. This was something that was planned in the mind of God. He understands this is what satisfies me. This is all that I accept. This is what I accept. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. If you're hidden away in him, I'll accept you. If you're not, you're going to face my wrath. My wrath fell on him. If it doesn't fall on him, if you're not in him where it fell, then it's going to fall on you. And he frankly, freely, we heard it last night, freely, fully forgives us of all our debt. And I never could figure out, but why did he do it there? I'm going through there looking, and it, it says in verse 42, it says, here's the word, it's four letters long. When, when these debtors, when they had nothing to pay, and that's hard for us to get a hold of. You know when you got saved, when you recognized you had nothing to offer God? You could not offer him your strength because the Bible says you're without it. You're in weakness. You could not offer him your righteousness because your best day, your, all of our righteousnesses, all of the good things we do, that's what's filthy rags. What about our open transgression of the law of God in his faith? We have no righteousness to offer him. Paul said when he looked at the righteousness of Jesus Christ and looked at his own righteousness, which he lists out there in Philippians chapter 3. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He said, man, I was circumcised on the eighth day. He goes, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I mean, I, I, I sat at the feet of uh, 
Gamaliel or Gamaliel, however you do it. I have no idea, amen, but the big G, Dr. G down there in Jerusalem, that's who Paul studied. He had all of this. He had degrees. His, he was the son of a Pharisee. It run in his family. He had all of that. He says, hey, at the end of the day, that's all I count, all of that but loss. And I count it dung. Yep. Dung is what that is. When I look in the face of pure love and pure righteousness. You know what Paul figured out on the road to Damascus? He came to the place where he realized that was the day when he had nothing to offer God. And that's the day he said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? Amen. And he became a new man on the inside. Amen. It's when you have nothing, no strength. No righteousness, all weakness, all wickedness. And God says, that's all right. That's what I'm looking for. You know who he'll save? The ungodly. One preacher talked about knocking on a door one time. And he said the lady came to the door. It was out in California. And he said to him and this preacher he was preaching for. And she says, I'll have you know I go to the First Baptist Church. And she was naming off all this. She was insulted that... He had come to the door. To, he said, well, look, we don't want to insult you. We just came to tell you about the gospel, the good news, and how Christ would give eternal life. And she said, I don't need all that. I go to church. I don't need you coming in here telling me about your, your ideas and your, your way. He said, well, let me just ask you a question before I go. He said, if you don't want to be saved, he said, that's fine. He says, but do you consider yourself ungodly? She said, of course not. He's like, well, you couldn't have got saved anyway. And she said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, because Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die for good people. He died for the ungodly. People all the time say to Christians, well, you think you're better than I am. You think you're better than us. No, actually, it's the other way around. You think you're better than us. I think I'm so low down, I need a Savior. You think you're so good, you don't need one. So really, you think your way, because you think you're going without a Redeemer. I've got to have the blood of Christ, and you don't. You're the one that's yeah. deceived. Yeah. Amen. I'm saying that Jesus Christ loved sinners. And he came just at the right time, and he proved his love. Because you know how you prove your love? You know what 2 Corinthians 8 tells us? Prove the sincerity of your love. You know what the context is? Giving your money. Amen. Praise the Lord. I knew. It's about how many amens you get at my home church, too. It's one thing to talk about, I love the Lord. Well, prove it. Give. God says, I love sinners. God, can you prove it? And he points us to a hill outside the city walls of Jerusalem, a place called Mount Calvary. What wondrous love is this, oh, my soul, oh, my soul. What wondrous love is this, oh, my soul. What wondrous love is this that calls the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul. To bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down. When I was sinking down, sinking down. When I was sinking down beneath God's righteous frown, Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. What wondrous love is this, oh my soul, oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, oh my soul. What wondrous love is this that calls the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul. To bear the dreadful curse for my soul. God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for proving your love 